So I wanted to talk about building collaborations with people who are not linguists but are working in other disciplines. These collaborations can be extraordinarily valuable and very rich, and they can enrich the kind of documentation that you do. Like any collaboration, they take time to build, and it's important to think about starting early because people with different areas of expertise can really help inform your project and inform the documentation. And if you take collaboration seriously, you want them in at the beginning or as soon as possible because they will shape things and bring new ideas to the table. So I think that finding collaborators is, can be very, very challenging. If you are planning a documentation project and you have a language or a region that you already know where you want to work, your own community or a community that you're familiar with, then you want to look for people who are interested in working in that area or who are already working there. When I think about collaborations, I think about collaborations across a broad range of people with a lot of different expertise. There's some that are very obvious to go to. Anthropologists who are looking at the way cultures work can be really great to work with. Musicologists are an obvious group of people and ethnomusicologists are in particular interested in working with communities to document and understand their music practices and they can be a very broad range of uh, performances understood very very broadly not just music but dance and, and oral traditions all fall into those things. Anthropologists are also concerned with that. But some of the really exciting collaborations that are taking place now are with Sort of less obvious groups. And I have in mind in particular I, people who are in biology departments, ecosystems ecologists, and that can be a very intimidating thought, but a lot of them are field researchers. So there's laboratory scientists who work in their labs, and they tend to not be good to partner with. But field scientists who go out in the field and look at flora or fauna, they look at the plant life or they look at the animal life and they're often looking at how humans interact with them. They even in, in the sciences call people the human dimension, which I think is very, very funny because I think of people as people, but they are often concerned with how humans are interacting with their environment their animal husbandry practices, fishing and hunting practices, plant gathering and plant usage, and field scientists are very good to partner with. They tend to be interested in working with communities to find out what particular knowledge they have, and often they're very excited, once, especially once you explain to them what you're doing, they can be more excited about working and partnering with linguists and with community members because they are trained in a very different way. They're trained to understand plants and how plants grow. They aren't trained to work with people and they need help. And people encapsulate their knowledge in language. And unless the field scientists are interested enough in the language to learn the language, they can't get at that information. And often even a translation will not suffice to talk about, to really help people understand all the deep information that is encoded in a language. So I think it's really terrific to partner with them. And some of the really interesting work has been done in the field. I know of a guy who spent maybe 10 years documenting the birds of paradise in Papua New Guinea as one example and he needed to work with local people to even understand what where the birds were how to film them how to find their habitats the local people know that and the external people don't so that's just one very small example but th that goes across the board for scientists so people who are looking and studying plants uh, fish the local animals sometimes are looking at domesticated animals, sometimes uh, wild herds. So there's a lot of people in Greenland who are interested in what's happening with the caribou herds. They are not domesticated, they run, they're wild. And the people who have the best knowledge of the movements of the caribou are the hunters. Uh, oceanographers co collaborate with people who are fishermen. Uh, 
in the Arctic where I work, there's lots of people who are hunting sea mammals, and they can tell you not just about where the mammals are, but they have been really providing important information about climate change because the, they are the first ones to see how the seal fat, for example, is responding to the environment. As the environment gets warmer, the, the seals are, the, the population is under distress, is under stress, and so the, the fat is getting thinner. So the hunters can provide that kind of information to the scientists and documenting those seal hunting practices and the language that the hunters use is a really valuable project for, for scientists and linguists and community members to collaborate on. So I think that it's really terrific to find non-traditional partners in these collaborations. Another group of people that is often overlooked in documentary linguistics is uh, social scientists, not just anthropologists, but people who are looking at what is going on in communities in terms of their life. We know that language is part, an important part of cultural and social well-being. And there are other indicators about social well-being. Suicide rates, alcohol rates, drug abuse, depression, all of those things that go into a culture. Linguists are not trained to look at them, and communities often are, don't have people who are trained to understand what's going on. And partnering with those people can help understand where the problems are, can help get important information about how societies are behaving, how they are living, and can be really an important way to reach people in the community. A lot of times language documentation leads into or is part of language revitalization efforts for communities. And one of the things that we see time and time again throughout the world is that working on the language promotes community well-being. So working with people who are interested in coming at community well-being from a different angle can really provide interesting resources and help and information and think about different kinds of questions to document. Uh, some of that stuff can be very, very sensitive, but some of it can also be very, very positive. I've been talking about negative things. So in terms of finding collaborators, I think that's one of the most challenging things. And the easiest place to look is in academic departments, in universities. So for people who are outside of an academic environment, wanting to do documentation and wanting to study a language, it's very good to find a partner in a university who can set up some of those initial meetings and the collaborations. That's one reason that it's very good and useful for linguists and community members to collaborate together. Often the linguist who is based at a, an academic institution will have an easier time setting up initial meetings and even explaining to scientists why they might find it useful to partner. But I think one of the challenges in documentation is really getting a rich set of different texts and different genres. And when you collaborate with other people in different disciplines, they ask different questions. And it's just really useful to have a lot of different viewpoints. Then you will be asking different questions and getting different kinds of language use and getting different kinds of cultural knowledge. And all of that enriches any documentation. You will get a different kind of lexicon if you're partnering with medical anthropologists because they will be asking about medical terms. I think linguists are very clear about asking about body parts, but we don't really know how to talk about health that well, and that's huge. And how different, different communities, different cultures even think about health issues is really, really important. So having different voices involved in documentation is tremendously useful. Different questions, and some of those people just have access to different kinds of people in the community, or people you might not, you might not think to ask certain questions of. So I think it just can enrich a documentation project in enormously powerful ways, in ways that are really useful, not just for understanding language, but for understanding the culture, and for understanding what's going on in a community that's, that's very, very helpful.